welcome to Come Home. I'm Jen Mallon. You know, sometimes I go for hours without coffee. It's called sleeping. <laughs> I don't drink coffee when I sleep. Neither do you, I hope. So grab your coffee, grab your tea, because today uh, you have a treat, a sweet treat. My guest is Annabelle Wallnow, and you are going to love her energy, her bold spirit. She has confronted some pretty big challenges in her city, and God has met her in a spectacular way. We're going to hear about her ministry, and we're also going to hear about her testimony. Uh, she and her husband Lance have been married for 37 years, and they have uh, beautiful children and grandchildren, and they've pastored, and, and God is just opening all kinds of huge doors for them to infiltrate the marketplace and business and the seven mountains, and they are on fire. They are really salt of the earth, and you're going to love them. She also has a great story about her spiritual journey before she met Jesus in the occult, dabbling in the occult, and how now God uses her to set others free that have dabbled in things that might have seemed innocent, but really opened huge doors for the enemy. So make sure you tune in, share it with others. I'm so grateful for viewers like you. So grateful that you tune in. Mostly I'm, I'm grateful that you pray over this program and that you give and that you participate in helping us continue uh, to be able to bring in powerful testimonies and powerful God stories. It brings such hope to our hearts and it revives our spirit when we can hear about others' uh, challenges and their journeys and then how God, the Trinity, has come through for them in miraculous ways. So stay tuned. Now we're gonna go to Dr. Michelle Carell and she has a very special hack on the Feast of Tabernacles. Thank you, Jen. I am really excited about the Feast of Tabernacles. You know the Feast of Tabernacles is a feast that we join with Israel, that the church so often joins with Israel in the biblical feast. But in the Feast of Tabernacles, we see a celebration together, celebrating the provisions of God and the power of his providence over our lives. But what exactly is the Feast of Tabernacles? The Bible shows us here in Leviticus chapter 23, three different types of celebrations that occur on the Feast of Tabernacles. Beginning in Leviticus chapter 23, looking at verse 34, the Bible says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the fifteenth day of this seventh month there shall be a feast of tabernacles, seven days unto the Lord. Then we see again. Also, verse 39, In this fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord. And in verse 42, you shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. So here we see different versions of the Feast of Tabernacles. One, in verse 34, it's called the Feast of Tabernacles. Two, we also see that in verse 39, it is called the Feast of Ingathering. And then again, beloved saints, we see in verse 42, the Bible is telling us you will dwell in booths. So how do we reconcile this? How is this personal, powerful, and prophetic in our lives? First of all, in gathering represents that this is the time of year when you shall gather in your labors out of the field. You know the Bible is very specific in the Exodus version of this feast that in Exodus chapter 23 verse 16 the Bible says in the end of the year when you have gathered in your labors out of the field. The Bible refers to your harvest as your labors. What does that mean? That means that during the feast of ingathering, God considers all your labor, whether it's travail, whether it's tears, whether it's those that sow in tears shall reap in joy, 
whatever form of labor that you have labored in, whether it's prayer or whether it's serving God in some way, this is the season that you shall reap when you have gathered in your labors out of the field. The Bible does not refer to the harvest as harvest. It uses the word specifically in Exodus 23, 16, as the word labors, because God wants you to know that he is validating and he is valuating everything you have ever done for the kingdom. And this is the season of supernatural reaping, even where there has been weeping in your life. God says, none of your tears are wasted. None of your trials are wasted. All right, so that's the Feast of Ingathering. But what about this business of booze? Do we just go out in our backyard and sleep in booze? Is that what this is about? I want you to understand something, beloved saints. All throughout the scripture, if we look for booze and the children of Israel actually dwelling in booze, the only place we actually see that word booze or Sukkot is this place right here in Leviticus chapter 23 when God says you will dwell in Sukkot seven days, booze seven days. So what are the booths since the Torah, since the word of God does not offer us any other language other than the fact that we dwell in them for seven days. Some of the commentaries teach us that the booths were not only physical booths, but they were also coverings, coverings and shelters over every tent in Israel, that the Almighty protected his people. He provided through the clouds of glory that every person dwelt in the secret place of the Most High God. You see, when Balaam, the false prophet, wanted to curse Israel, the Bible says that he looked for different places to curse Israel. And when he came up upon one of the mountains, he overlooked the mountain and he saw Jacob abiding in his tents. And do you know what? He saw the glory of God over every tent. And instead of cursing, all he could do was bless. This is a feast of God's protection over your tent. Let us celebrate the feast of booze and the feast of ingathering by knowing that God sees our labors and God is protecting us even from wicked imaginations and devices from the enemy. I love Dr. Michelle. She brings such rich truth and in, in revelation. You know, Leviticus 23 tells us that we are to acknowledge these feasts forever and forever means forever. And so it's such a joy to learn about them and then ask the Holy Spirit, what can we incorporate in our lives to give honor to these feasts of the Lord. They are called moeds, which means appointments. And so God wants to have a special appointment with you during this season. Ask him how you can embrace it in your family or even just you personally. But today we have a powerhouse woman. I love uh, Jesus girls that are just uh, boss leaders and who see a need and make it happen. And you are going to enjoy and love Annabelle Wall now. So welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank for you for inviting being me. here. So fun. Oh, such an honor. Okay, so before we jump into your story, I do want to show you a clip of her ministry and and how she is uh, fulfilling the Great Commission in her city. Hi, I'm Annabelle Walnow, founder of Furnishing Families of Texas. We are the outreach arm of Lance Walnow Ministries, and the whole thing began because of a water problem in my house that we had to give away a bedroom set when we gave, offered to give it to the Center for Transforming Lives, and we offered to give it to one of the moms. She said, can you get me a twin bed for my seven-year-old? He never slept on a bed in his life, and they slept on a couch, on the floor, in an air mattress, in the car, but not on a mattress. So my friend Wanda was with me. She said, not on my watch. So she bought the first twin bed. Now we bought over 250 twin beds. 
Hey, my name is Lance and this is my wife, Jamie Lynn, and uh, we're here today at the Furnishing Families of Texas Outreach in Fort Worth. We actually went out at the beginning of the event to uh, neighboring communities and uh, try to get the word out about the event. At the same time, we were knocking on doors, giving food out as well. And this is totally the gospel. This is going into the world, making disciples of nations. It's handing people clothes, food. It's what is your need? We want to help provide it. Hi, my name is Sharon Richardson and I volunteer for Furnishing Families. I'm here today um, serving in the prayer tent and uh, we've been praying for people and actually the very first person that came in the tent today, we just felt the Holy Spirit fall. I mean, the thickness and the presence of God was so thick. I mean, we were just had goosebumps up and down our arms. And then just within the last, you know, 30 minutes, we had a young mom, 17 years of old, age, a uh, newborn baby, and she accepted Jesus into her heart. So we are celebrating everything that God's doing today. It's, uh, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Hi, I'm Lance Wall now, and Annabelle, my wife, is actually the visionary behind this, Furnishing Families in Texas, started with her realization there were single moms that did not have furniture. Children didn't have beds, they didn't have kitchen tables, and, and she was looking at what to do in other countries and realized she could do something right here in her own backyard. And all of this is like surprising people with the goodness of God, surprising them. Last week a family had their house burnt down just recently. Their, their, all their belongings, and all of a sudden Annabelle finds out about it, happens to have an estate sale, picks up this furniture, it's like an upgrade. People come home to the apartment, it's completely furnished, better than even the last place. That is the kind of, uh, of work that the kingdom of God is all about. It's like healing. It's like, it's a form in a sense of manifesting the abundance of heaven on earth. That's what Furnishing Families is all about. Okay, so that was amazing. My husband and I did outreach. We were outreach pastors and youth pastors for 12 years. You know and all so, about it, man. Yes, 10, 10 inner city areas wow. in Tampa. And so we saw that. And I will say, you whispered to me, uh, you've now done over a thousand twin beds. Yeah. That's huge. It's a lot of people sleeping a good night's sleep. Oh, that, and that's so meaningful. You, you know, they say... Our, a quote unknown is uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so you are showing them you care. That's true. Through this ministry. Yeah. It's Jesus with skin on before we ever mentioned Jesus' name. Yeah. We love them and they feel something they didn't know about too much, you know? I love What it. was that? I don't know. And then you just have that little trust, that little bridge trust bridge beginning. And then you find out if they have prayer needs. And a lot of people that we meet are actually just in that place where they've lost that connection because their hope got deferred, their That's heart right. got sick. So they got rededicated. We see more rededications than we see brand new salvations. Yeah. Is that amazing? Yeah. Because the seed's in there. Yeah. It's, it's so important. Mm -hmm. But, you know, some plants, some water... You know, some fertilize, but it's God that brings the increase. Congrats. But so that's, I know your heart. And the most important thing about this ministry is praying and seeing Jesus move. Yes. Yeah. Well, one reason I know you're passionate about this is, is because of your own story. And so uh, I know we're going to unpack some of the, the ministry later. Um, and anyone that wants to go to furnishingfamiliesoftexas.com, right? Right. Furnishingfamiliesoftexas.com. Or ffotex.com. Ffotex. It's just a brief, you know, it's just a yes. letter. Yes, ffotex.com. It's just a lot. Mouthful. Yeah. Yeah. So you can <laughs> give, you can support, you can get newsletters, you can just see all kinds of things. But I want to shift and I want to talk about, you're Italiano like me. Yay. And I want to shift back to your family, the environment you grew up in, um, your religious upbringing, and uh, because I know that in your life, you dabbled in the occult, you went on a spiritual journey, it was very easy for you to kind of slip back into that be because of what you saw growing up, because our childhood affects us. Mm -hmm. So share a little bit about your growing up years. Okay. I have a beautiful family. My parents had eight children. One died, so we grew up with seven children. Wow. And our parents were really, they were really impressed by how to get along, how to actually play outside, how to be creative and develop things. We were not really, we really shared a television, 
the three channels, we can only watch like one hour. I mean, we really did. We had a whole different upbringing than today's children. Right. Okay, first of all. And then so second of all, we were Catholics. So we all went to church together. But at a certain age, I could slip away and because we could walk to church, too. But I could just skip church. Yeah. I could ditch church <laughs> and I could run through and get a bulletin to prove I was there. But. I ended up becoming... I did that. I did that. But I did it at the Presbyterian Church. I got the bulletin. But. See what I mean? I was like, hey, I was a church. Hey. But, you know, um, the thing is, I became a really good liar. And so at, in third grade, I think in second grade, I became a really good liar. I wasn't ditching church yet. But by third grade, I didn't even make my confirmation on time. You know, in the Catholic Church, you get communion, you get confirmation. It's all during different age groups. Yeah. My parents were like, you can't get your confirmation until you stop being a liar. So, I mean, and then I was taking my grandma's name, Gertrude as my middle name, and I did get it when I was going into third grade. So my point of saying it is I was still, I was just, I didn't really get born again. I just was dealing with a, a disposition, right? But when the Bible says when you are running as a liar, you actually become partners with the destroyer and the destruction. The, the demon world is, is real. When you open a, a door for it, you know, you actually don't even really know how much you get it into it. It's how much it gets into you. That's so right. in my experience, you know, I went, I went off to college. And in college, you know, if you don't have your identity solidified, your wet cement, and you're out there for whoever is going to get you attracted to whatever their belief systems are. So, you know, I went to the Rhode Island School of Design. And first of all, the community there is very uh, open, you know, to a lot of things. So, 40% of my friends were homosexual. I was the weirdo heterosexual in the first place. But, you know, um, in high school, I was a drug dealer, so I got my drugs for free. And, you know, I was an entrepreneur. But in college, you know, <laughs> there was a lot of other things that got involved with that, of, yeah. you know, being open to the occult. And I went to India in 1978. So in India, you know, they have so much unknown gods. Right. You know, so I had, I had brought back a lot of artifacts from India and rice prints and I was fascinated with it, you know, I was just fascinated with it, and I loved it, and I thought it was just so powerful, but when I was uh, living on Benefit Street, I made friends with a girl who was from Jamaica who was a witch, and studying to be in the Wicca, you know, Wiccan witch, and um, the thing about it is that I loved all the power she was moving in, so I, I was fascinated with being in art school, it's real close to magic, I mean, art is just a real interactive thing when you behold it, when you create it, yeah. and we had... My dad gave me 100 rolls of film and told me, here, go learn how to make a movie. I was a film major. So we would do the I Ching and the tarot cards <clears throat> in college, and it would tell us who was coming, what they were going to say, and what was going to happen. And then it would come to life, and we'd make these little short stories. It was so amazing. But, I mean, I'm not trying to glorify it. I'm just saying how I got sucked in deeper and deeper. Yeah, yeah. And so, and that's what happens, right? Yeah. So I guess, in, in other words, we were even ta calling forth our provisions. Like, my dad paid all my bills in college, and I had amazing credit everywhere, of course. And so after four years of college, I stayed in Rhode Island an extra year involved with this deeper occult lifestyle. And so when I told my dad how much debt I had, he's like, Annabelle, you have ruined your name. Oh. And I'm like, dad. And he goes, you cannot stay there. You have to move home and get out of debt. You have to get pay all those people back and blah, blah, blah. And so I was just like, oh, man. <laughs> so my trajectory of my occult existence was shifting. And so I came back home and I had all these jobs and every morning my dad would yell up the steps, Annabelle, what's the plan on? <laughs> like, cause I had, I didn't know what hat I was wearing that day. I was a photographer. I was a makeup artist. I was, I was doing so much stuff and I just was paying back my landlord. I told him how much rent I owed him. My, uh, because the I Ching said I was in inner truth. It's a hexagram. And I was realizing, oh my gosh, I'm living a lie. I have all this debt. So that's when I told my dad. But the other girl, she never told our landlord how much debt she had. And she lived there. She lived there a really long time without paying him back. I mean, the point is, you know, no people don't believe in the devil. <laughs> they don't realize the devil is really uh, alive. A force to be reckoned <laughs> and with. And there really is evil. I mean, so you can't tell me it's too late now to tell me it's not true, right? Because I already was in yeah. that world for a long time. That's right. And then when I moved back to Pennsylvania and got out of debt, my parents moved three houses away from Lance's family and we knew I've known Lance since I was um, nine years old so when they moved back and we got reconnected and he led me to the Lord wow. so that was a big shift boy and truthfully that was when I was 24 years old so I'm 64 years old now so yeah. imagine that amazing life change yeah craze crazy yeah. crazy great and you were just ready to receive Jesus well actually I I said yeah I'll try he brought his pastor and I was like yeah I'll try it I'll try that and his pastor goes 
Lance, you told us she was ready. She's not ready. You don't try Jesus on like a shoe. And I was like, I don't know my lines. I don't know my line. What am I supposed to say? I don't understand what's going on here. You know, I had this big fuchsia flower in my hair. I had a green to Hawaiian shirt, red it. ripstop nylon pants, silver high top leather sneakers. That pastor looked at me like, whoa, who is this chick, right? And then when I said that, he's like, we're out of here. But then when Lance brought him back, I lived in the house I grew up with uh, in that was deeded in 1696. So there, I mean, I was still there when my parents moved to the three houses away from Lance's family. There was a lot of demonic activity in that house. There was spirits in that house. And like, I was friends with those spirits. When, when Lance led me to the Lord, those spirits became very uh, aggressive. They were slamming doors upstairs and doing stuff to freak me out. I stayed in the TV room and I had curtains and one, you know, they would make the curtains flow and it says 58 degrees and then change it to 80 degrees. I was like, you know, this is a little run obvious, you know, you can't freak me out. So Lance would come over and I had to, there, there's so this noise. He goes, who, who's here? Who's here? I go, it's just them. He goes, who? I go, those spirits, they don't like you. <laughs> and he's like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, it, you know, this is what's going on. So we put Alexander Scurvy on the tapes with the Bible, you know, and Jesus. It was a very mono. Yes, we thought yes. we could torture these demons, right, with the word, but also with the guys. So like, and Jesus said, you know. <laughs> and so we changed the tape every day so they have to hear a different, you know, book of the Bible. But then Lance put this big poster, a charcoal drawing of Jesus being crucified in the foyer, which... I never really liked the picture because it's so grueling, but we figured we're torturing them. Yeah. But there were these two spirits that one was shaped like a Christmas tree with a pinhead and one was shaped like a Lincoln with a, a tuxedo with tails at the top hat. We grew up seeing those spirits. I mean, I saw them. My grandma saw them. My sister Lisa saw them. And my grandma talked to them all the time. And I never talked to them, but I, I was very familiar with them. But my point is, Lance <laughs> brought his pastor over one day and he comes in the house and his pastor, like, he was still checking me out, too. And, and uh, he goes in the house, and he steps back. He goes, whoa, Lance, you didn't tell me we had, we had uh, visitors. And Lance goes, what, who, where, what? Because Lance never saw him. Yeah. And he goes, I go, well, who do you see? Because I'm now checking them out. Right? Yeah. Because I feel very judged, you know. Yeah. And he goes, well, it's like these two spirits, one's shaped like a Christmas tree with a pinhead, and one looks like Abe Lincoln with a top hat. Because he looked in the library, and that's oh, where they wow. were. Wow. And so... He saw them. He saw them. And so Lance was just so beside himself. Because he's like, I don't see anything. But so that's when, um, really, there was a real crossing of the swords. And they realized not only did I have to get born again, I needed to get filled with the Holy Ghost and have a bonfire, get rid of all my, all my occult stuff. I had so much occult stuff. Yeah. And so we really cleaned out the house. That's important. It's way important. It's, it's the imp funniest thing, though. Lance trying to make this bonfire with all my stuff because I had a lot of rice prints from India, and he used a whole can of lighter fluid. It wouldn't go on. <laughs> the flyer wouldn't go on, and we were. I was like pretty surprised actually, and so I didn't really know why. But then he used the second can, and <laughs> when he lit it, he like started spinning around in a circle because it went, <laughs> and his little aviator glasses fell off, and he stepped on them. I was like. But anyway, all these like cinders were going up, and we weren't thinking about that. And we were like, no, don't fall on the roof. Don't start a fire. <sighs> but it didn't. But anyway, it was so exciting. So you introduced Lance to a whole different side, <laughs> right? Know, right. <laughs> but, you know, that story, um, Annabelle, because you and Lance pastored for 20 years. Mm -hmm. God's using you so mightily right now um, in the marketplace and with the Seven Mountains. But how has that, how has you overcoming that and getting on the other side of it helped you leading other people out? Because sometimes Christian parents uh, think, oh, well, just a little abracadabra, a little witchcraft, little occult, little Ouija board. It's not so bad. And that's just make-believe, but it really can be detrimental. Well, the Bible says that you're cursed, your children curse, your grandchildren are cursed, your great-grandchildren are cursed. It's a situation. Yeah. So once you actually put that bloodline down and you you renounce it, all you have to do is renounce it. Yeah. Because the blood of Jesus is greater than all of that. That's right. But what happens is it gives you an understanding that God is going to be able to make you into that person he's called yeah. you to be. It doesn't matter what you've been coming out of. I mean, some people will tell me, but I have this, like this big long list of things. It's like, so, yeah. you know, God throws it in the sea of forgetfulness. That's and then right. you just start from today and you look for the future. You stand in the present, you toss the past, and you go towards the future, towards him. That's right. Because he's the recreation. So we only have a couple minutes left, and I want you just to minister to anyone watching that has had that struggle. Maybe they've never repented, renounced, you know, whatever the case may be. 
Um, but I, I just want you to minister. Okay. I would just bring you uh, your attention to the mirror. If you look into the mirror of the Lord, see what the Lord sees, and just talk to him about your heart, like be honest and say everything you can think of, but then ask him to reveal what's hidden from you. And it could even be in the bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness category that's putting a lid over your ability to go there. Because really what you're going to do is break the trauma of it off your cells so that it's not only people are not, you, you may be coming out of a lot of what feels like change. So because you can't crawl out of the pit, you need to fly out of the pit. And that's what the Holy Spirit will do. So I would love to lead you into a prayer and just say, Jesus, forgive all my sins. And it's as simple as that. Jesus, forgive all my sins. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, make me into that person that you've called me to be. God's got a plan for you. It's like I got a lot less to do with what you think it is. And he's going to reveal it to you. So this is your day. Go towards him. Amen. 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 And, you know, it, it's as simple as that. It's as simple as just saying, I stop the nonsense. I stop the foolishness. And... You know, there's a scripture that says that we are to love the things God loves and hate the things that God hates. Mm. And God's very clear on sorcery and witchcraft and spirits and, and, and dabbling in darkness. And many of us as children, you know, something was presented to us just like you. A door was open. You were fascinated. But I just want you to know, just as Annabelle prayed for you, God forgives. God mm. reveals. Yeah. The enemy is a master liar and a master deceiver. He wants mm. to keep you in the dark. He doesn't want the truth to be exposed or revealed because then he can keep you um, in captivity. And, you know, Jesus came to set the captives free. Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. And that's what he has for you today, friend. So I would just uh, invite you, if you prayed this prayer with Annabelle, would you write in? Would you call us? Would you share with us? Uh, let us know how we can partner with you in your journey, help you find a local church, get involved. Some of you might need deliverance or inner healing because the word also says that, you know, we've got to go in and bind the strong man. And but if we don't fill the house with the word, with worship, with with tongues, then he can come back and bring seven more spirits. We don't want that for you. The blood of Jesus is enough. The forgiving power of Jesus Christ is enough. And God is walking you on a journey. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you so much. So thank you for being part of the show today. Annabelle has been amazing. Go visit her website. It's on the screen. And join us again because we're going to talk about her mission and her ministry. I'm Jen Mallon. Come home. Come home.